Good morning all. Um, uh, um, my name is Lawrence. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the, the new vice chairman of BABS um, and I'm also hosting this session and trying to manage the technicalities of it all. Um, so we'll, I'm going to pass over to, to Dr Williams in just a second to start um, as I admit more people. Um, if you could all keep yourselves on mute um, during the presentation, <clears throat> please feel free to type your questions into the chat and um, Jennifer will will try to sort of address them as we go through or save them to the end and we can have a, a discussion in the for the last sort of 10-15 minutes. Um, Dr Williams has also been kind enough to share a, a PDF handout for you all. Um, I don't know if people can see that in the chat or maybe I will get her to share it again. Someone can give me a thumbs up if you can see a, a PDF handout in the chat or whether... Maybe at the top of the chat no. and then you can just drag it to your screen. I think it might be worth resharing it now that people are in, if oh, possible, yeah, uh, and therefore is, people don't need to scribble down notes uh, as we go through because it's all there for you, which is wonderful. Um, PDF, there it is coming in now. Excuse me, could you send it round by email because I'm in my car right now and I can't do anything on, on, on video. Thank you. Okay, I can't send it by email because I don't have everyone's email address. So if you if you if you send, uh, we'll we will get it and send it around by email. If if Dr. Williams is happy with that. Um, yes. <laughs> um, so yes, we will make sure that that happens. Uh, I'm sure that Shanna has got everybody's uh, contact details from when you signed up. And we have got. If you don't get it, then shout. Send an email and ask. <laughs> I would suggest. Thank you so much. Okay, um, so we okay. are going to start. Yes, we've got 58 people now and uh, That's my, my screen is looking very busy. Um, so yes, uh, Dr. Williams is going to share her slides for you now. And we are delighted to have her here this morning, uh, leading a wonderful session for us. She is an expert in the field of vocal health and singing teaching. And uh, I'm sure she would be embarrassed for me to go on, but she was the first uh, singing teacher to be awarded a PhD in voice, in voice science in the UK. And she won the 2010 BBA Van Lawrence Prize for her outstanding contribution to voice research. So we are delighted and very lucky to have her here this morning. So without further ado, over to you. Whoops, I'm getting confusing Zoom bits here. Go away, that bit. <laughs> Come back that bit. There, you got the screen share now. You can see the, the slide. Hello, I'm Ginevra Williams. Um, I'm a singing teacher, really. I just do a bit of research and most of what I spend my time doing now is training teachers. Um, so this is why I've done more research into educational theory and learning theory and motor skills, um, because it's actually quite important. Let me get the message right. If we know how the brain is actually learning stuff, we're going to we're going to get the message right when we try and program it. <clears throat> so this is one of my favourite quotes. Um, so I'll just mute, mute people over here. Um, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled. So if you're teaching anybody, you're basically just going around lighting fires. Let's think about learning. And to put it in into some context, we've got this hierarchy of competence here. So the bottom level is when you don't know anything about it and you don't know that you don't know anything about it. Um, so that's our unconscious incompetence. And then you get to a stage where you realize there's something out there that you want to be finding out about, but you don't know anything about it. And that's conscious incompetence. And then you start learning and practicing and being taught and, and enhancing your skills. And you reach conscious competence, which is when you can do whatever it is you're wanting to do, but you have to think about it. And then when you reach a more highly skilled level, you can do it without thinking. So this is what we are doing when we're learning from the minute we're born. We are learning to do things. We are learning how to interact with people. We're learning all sorts of information. And we go through these stages as we learn. So what is learning? It's just a 
a way of, of learning skills and we try them out and we get better at it. Now you can't see learning. You can't see if someone has learned something. You can only see if they're then able to do the task or remember the information. So you can only observe the outcome of the learning. And we're going to think about two types of learning here where we've got explicit learning and implicit learning. So the perceptual learning is learning the theoretical concept. So for example, if I told you that if you lift your chin up when you sing a high note, that's actually going to put, pull on the muscles that are holding the larynx and it's going to mean that your flexibility for singing is going to be compromised and it won't be as good. All right? You can understand that from a theoretical concept that doing that won't help your singing. But in order to program it into your activity, you need to rehearse it over and over again because your habit is going to send you back to the old place that you're used to. So you have to relearn and reprogram your brain and repeat over and over again until whenever you sing a high note, you've programmed your body to remain stable. And then you, that's the implicit learning. And it doesn't really work until it's implicit, because if you're having to think about it all the time, it's too confusing. You need those things programmed in. So this is what Skinner said about memory, that education is what survives when what has been learned has been forgotten. You never knew that you had to learn it in the first place. Thinking of memory, we've got three, roughly three types of memory. We've got the short term memory, which is everything. Everything goes in to your brain. Um, and the short term memory only lasts for 20 or 30 seconds. All right? And during that time, you have to decide what to keep hold of and what to let go of. And nearly everything that we experience, we let go of because there's far too much going on in our lives. Um, and that is why if you faint or you're knocked unconscious, you don't remember what happened immediately before that because the short term memory hasn't got saved. So it goes from the short term memory into the working memory. And this is where we, we, we decide what we're going to hold on to. We, we can keep juggling things in our short term memory for a certain amount of time before we then put them into the longer term. And just a note to say that the, the hippocampus is very important for our uh, working memory. And you can uh, enlarge your hippocampus by going for walks in the countryside. Did you know that? So if you walk in a, a rural environment for 40 minutes a day, you will enlarge your hippocampus more than if you walk in an urban environment or if you don't go for a walk. So this is, I mean, we've, we've known for years that it makes you feel better, but there is now actual research to, to show that, how important it is. And then we get to the long-term memory, and this is where we have those two that I explained, the explicit and the implicit. Um, so the explicit is, is um, for example, encoding a recall. So things like learning your tables, learning how numbers work. Right, that will be explicit learning. Um, and the implicit learning is mostly motor skills. And the habits, of course, are in the brain. We talk about muscle memory, but muscles are pretty stupid. They don't remember anything. Muscles only do what they're told by the nerves that fire them. So the memory is in the brain, not in the muscles. Um, now we're going to try a little memory test. I don't know whether you've got a pen and paper handy, but if you haven't, you can imagine. Right? What we're going to do is you're going to try and remember 
what is on each side of a one pound coin. Now, I know we haven't been handling cash so much recently, but you can remember what a one pound coin looks like because you've handled one pound coins all your life. But if I asked you to draw what was on each side of a one pound coin, right? if anybody's actually drawing one, they could hold it up to their camera and we can see how accurate you are. <laughs> this is where you see people laughing because they just can't remember. What is it? Which way round is the head? But <laughs> there's Mike's got got one. I can't see that terribly well. Oh yes, very simple. Very, very simple. Queen, a queen and a thistle. <laughs> and a thistle. Good, good, good. Um right, I'm gonna put you out of your misery and show you what we have. So it's actually quite a lot more complicated than you may have remembered. Did you remember the border? Did you remember the writing in the border? So why don't we remember that? Why don't we recall that? Because it's not important. All right, it's not important for handling money. We need to know the weight and the shape and we need to be able to tell it apart from other coins. But we don't necessarily remember the picture because we don't need to. So memory is selective, right? We remember what we need to remember or what we choose to remember. And also memory needs meaning. So if you look at a chessboard, if you are familiar with the game, you will see certain patterns. If you are a chess master, you will memorize that board very quickly because those patterns have a meaning for you. Um, and memories are interconnected as well. They relate to other things which we're coming to. So back to motor learning, back to motor learning. So this is any skill, physical skill, so it's a it's sport, it's playing an instrument, um, walking. Walking is a brilliant example because we don't think about it, but it's actually quite difficult to learn to walk because you're having to balance on one leg. And I mean, being on two legs anyway is quite complicated. It's a complicated balancing act. And then walking from one to the other takes a lot of practice. And of course, to do that, we need to fall over lots of times. Um, and actually, uh, research into toddler, looking at toddlers learning to walk, that the ones who fall over the most learn to walk the quickest. So if you take the risks and make the mistakes, you will learn more quickly than the cautious ones. So this is where in your rehearsals and some, you know, the MD says, right, loud and wrong, just, just get it wrong, but I need to hear what's going on. You need to work through those mistakes. You need to make the mistakes in order to then learn more quickly how to get it right. Um, in the brain, we've got these links going on. And this is what memory is. It's basically just getting these links to fire more frequently and connect it with the activity. So we've got nerve pathways in the brain. Um, and you can see in this picture here, there's a gap between the two nerve endings and the message needs to go from one to the other. And for that, we need neurotransmitters which I'm going to come on to. The more times the message goes down that neuron, the more we have a buildup of myelin, which is this matter here, which is like insulation. And the myelin building up means that the message will, will go down more quickly and more easily. So the more myelin you build, the better your memory and the quicker you will do that task. 
So you can imagine in young children, they are forming myelin really, really quickly and really easily. You know, they learn things very, very easily. And there are certain skills that are very difficult to learn at a later age. Speaking a language without an accent is very difficult to learn beyond the age of about seven or eight. Um, and certain motor skills for instrumentalists, if you are a, a string player or a, a pianist, those skills in the fingers need to be learned at a very, very young age. But it's not all disaster. You can still learn when you're older. You can still form myelin all your life. It's just a little bit slower, that's all. The neurotransmitters that we need are things like dopamine. And these neurotransmitters are produced in greater quantity when we're happy. So when we, we create dopamine, when we are enjoying something, pleasure and liking something, but we also create dopamine when we are thinking about something that we are then desiring. So it's the anticipation that also gives us that flood of dopamine. And so when we are happy and when we are looking forward to something, we will form memories more easily. So this is important because we need to know that if somebody is in a happy state of mind, they will learn. And this is, you know, it's, <laughs> it's a no brainer, really. But educating children, if you have happy children, they will learn much more effectively than if they're scared. But it's only recently that we've actually worked out the science behind that. So we need to be happy, we need to be enjoying ourselves, then we will learn. That's the same information. Yep, it strengthens the attention. So back to myelin. Now myelin, excuse me, I'm just going to move my desk up a little bit. There we go. Um, myelin is uh, that what moves the memories more, the, the activities more fast in the brain. Um, now, if we are replacing a habit, which is what we're doing a lot of the time when we're learning to sing and we're learning to sing better. We're replacing old habits with new ones. And that is more difficult because our brain will automatically follow the old path. So we've got to forge the new path. We've got to go, go through the forest and we've got to bash down the, the undergrowth and it's hard work to begin with. And then the more times you go through it, the more that path is is worn and eventually we're building highways in the brain and if you're replacing one with another you need to go down the new one as often as possible and let the other one you just abandon it yeah if you leave a highway and don't maintain it nature will come and grow and grow all over it all right and the same happens in the brain Yep. If you abandon those pathways, they will just get less. So what have we learned? Conscious memory is selective, according to need. Remember the pound coin. Subconscious memory is learned through repetition. Uh, you can't observe learning, only the effect of learning. And, and it's aided by mood. We need to be attentive, alert and safe. Now we have templates in the brain or schema. So I've got a template for picking up a glass, all right, based on the grasping reflex, which we're born with. But I've refined that to be able to reach for a glass, pick it up and I don't have to think about it. I don't drop it, I don't spill the water that's in it, I just pick it up. Now I'm adapting that schema for that particular glass. I happen to know that it's mostly full of water, so it's going to be heavier than if it didn't have any water in it at all. 
I know roughly how big it is to grasp it. I know how slippery it's going to be. So all of those decisions are made subconsciously. I'm adapting an existing action for a particular task. When I do that, my focus is on the glass. Now this is really important because we focus on the glass in order to refine the task. I don't think about what my hand is doing. I'm not thinking about how tightly my fingers are squeezing the glass. I'm thinking about stopping the glass from falling. And this is how we learn best is if we focus on the outcome and not on the process. And it works most of the time. Only if the task fails do we need to pay attention to details. So in singing, we use this to refine a skill by changing certain variables and leaving the other ones. So if we're learning a tricky passage, we approach it using lots of different ways into that schema. So we'll do it slowly. We'll do it in short sections. We'll do it in different rhythms. Back chaining is when you learn the last bar and then the last two bars and then the last three bars. So you learn from the end backwards. Um, we may learn the same intervals at a different pitch. We may try it to different vowels. So you can see that every time we're just changing one of the variables, we're finding different ways in to reinforce that learning. So we're breaking things down into tiny elements, repeating them, adding them together, and then it's bundling or chunking. So when we've learned those small elements and put them together, they then become one unit themselves. Our brain remembers it as one unit. And that can be a whole page of music, it can be a whole song that our brain remembers as one unit. And then it becomes automatic. These skill based learning applies to, I say, learning to sing, learning to put on a shirt, learning to speak. And we know that if you have to teach somebody these skills following a, a brain injury, if they've had a stroke, for example, they have to relearn them, but they can relearn them and it does come back. And we can transfer one skill to another. So we can, if you're good at tennis, you're probably going to pick up badminton more quickly. Um, if you're good at playing the piano, you're probably going to pick up the violin more quickly because there are ways in to those skills. So here we've learned about patterns and predictions in the brain. And we find something similar that's already there. And we change certain elements of it and, and adapt it. So this is where one of my all time mantras is start with what you can do. Start with what you find easy. So when we're learning something, learning a tricky piece of music or practicing something, it's so tempting to jump into the difficult bit and work on that. But our brain will work much better if we start with what it can do well. We start with the easy bit and then we gradually, gradually extend it. So if you find a certain vowel easier than another one, you use the one you enjoy singing more. And then you try the more tricky one. So we start with what's easy. We find many ways in, keep varying it. We isolate bits and then we integrate them. Um, and that we know that transferring skills is easier than learning brand new ones. Are you with me so far? <laughs> this romp through. 
All right, focus and attention. What do we focus on? Do you remember I said, when I pick up the glass, I focus on the glass, I don't focus on my hand. When we are, for example, if you're throwing darts at a dartboard um, and you've, you've got three tries, all right, you're heading for the bullseye. The first one is probably gonna miss. The second one may have a better chance of getting near the third one, you're gonna be nearer. What are you focusing on when you do that? You're focusing on the dartboard. You're looking at where you're throwing the dart. You're not adjusting what's going on in your wrist and your fingers. Right? That's what's changing. As you throw a dart, that's what's doing it, is what's going on in your wrist and your fingers. But paying attention to that won't actually give you a better outcome. You pay attention to the board and your body will sort out the rest. So here's an example. Um, if a phrase needs a shape, all right, a beginning, a middle and an end to it. How would we give an instruction to the singer? Well, I might say, come on, tell me what's the most important note in that phrase. Uh, and then I'd say, well, sing it again and show me how much you love that note. Uh, that may well do the trick, all right? But sometimes that might give a bit too much pressure. It might make it last too long. It might disturb the flow. It might not work entirely because it's an imaginative concept. So then we need to, to change that and intervene with something more explicit. But if you start with the imaginative, you're more likely to have the better outcome. And in fact, internally directed instruction uh, can have a negative effect. So if you're trying to do something with your jaw in a different position, or if you're trying to keep your tongue somewhere, if you're trying to keep, you know, any internal instruction, um, it takes too long for the, the message to get from your brain to that part to make a difference in time. So actually focusing on internal activity when you are singing will quite often cause more of a problem than it solves. You need to do that when you're practicing, when you're learning. Yeah. And in the later stages, you focus on the outcome, you focus on the intention, the emotion, the shape, the quality of the sound. Give an external focus on the effect of the change, not the change itself. Um, and we know what it's like when we are in the zone. You know, athletes talk about this, musicians talk about it, when everything is just going really, really well and you're almost Kind of it's almost like an out-of-body experience you're not really present you're just it's there it's happening it's a wonderful feeling it doesn't happen very often but it's great when it does happen um if we shift to that internal focus we actually put the brakes on that whole process so you have to trust your skills you have to learn them and trust them and when you get to a performance you can't be tweaking and changing things. You've just got to go with it. Um, I'll put a caveat there. We do need to have a little bit of our attention open to things that might be different when we're performing because there are going to be distractions. You'll see someone in the audience you're not expecting to see. Something will go wrong. Someone will come on the wrong side of the stage. Um, something will go wrong with a piece of clothing <laughs> you know things happen and you've got to be able to adapt to those and keep smiling and pretend nothing's going wrong but on the whole we're going with the flow so here's some more examples of ways in which we can phrase our instructions to be more helpful um 
The first one, what I would say is a meaningless instruction, which is support the sound to the end of the phrase. Um, that has no intrinsic meaning whatsoever, unless somebody's explained what they mean by that and what they want you to do. That in itself doesn't give you any help. Um, if you say that to somebody, they'll probably just work harder or grip harder or push. Yep. Um, an internal direction would be keep your abdomen moving inwards to the end of the phrase. Now that's probably what is happening. All right? Your tummy will be moving as you sing because the air is leaving your body. Um, and that will be what is sustaining the sound. But focusing on that isn't going to help. Uh, an external focus could be sing with the same energy to the end of the phrase. So we're getting more into the imaginative, um, the affect here. However, the emotional one if you say to a singer, remain passionate until you've made your point, that will do everything all at once. So we're getting into the whole system, this motor skills system, by using imagination and emotion. Because they've already, those pathways are already there. Your body knows how to do that. So we need to, to use a goal, not an action, we need to stay positive, be in the moment, and use emotion and imagination. Just a few other little points. Um, sensory perceptions. Um, people sometimes talk about preferred learning styles. You know, visual, auditory, or kinesthetic. There's no neurological evidence for that. All right, there's nothing in the brain that is different to suggest that you may be one or the other. Um, and in fact, if you focus on one particular sensory style, then you're missing out. And it's much, much more effective to use all of them. So in teaching, we try and give a visual cue or an auditory cue, it sounds like, um, kinesthetic, so that is what it, the sensations in your own body, but also imaginative uh, ideas like, I want you to sing it like velvet or like silk or like sandpaper. And those are all imaginative concepts that are kinesthetic. So we need to keep variety. And if you keep the sensory input varied, then it's going to be much more effective learning. Um, sorry, the mixing and blurring of our sensory awareness was other bits that I cut out. <laughs> we'll have to have that another day. Um, challenge is again really important for learning. All right, so we know something, we can do it, we then have to challenge it. So a simple one is, if you can sing a phrase, all right, can you sing that phrase whilst I chuck a tennis ball at you? And can you throw and catch a ball at the same time? Can you walk around the room and sing it? Those are the sort of challenges that I'm talking about. Just to see if you can do it whilst doing something else then we know the learning is embedded, then we know you've learned it. And then as a teacher, we're giving feedback. We're saying, that was great. Now can you try it like this? Um, and this is augmented feedback. So that's the feedback that someone else gives you. All right, so that's probably your MD. Uh, you are giving yourself your own feedback all the time as well. We've got to get the balance right, because too much feedback means that you aren't processing things yourself, and too little means that you're not getting useful information. 
Um, and so what we know now from uh, research is that in the early stages of learning, you need more feedback. And then in the later stages, you need less. So if you're working with somebody who's very experienced or you're working with a group who know a piece quite well, you don't need to keep telling them how to do it. Just say, try it again, try it again. And their own internal feedback will be sorting stuff out and putting it right. And self-reflection, of course, is the best feedback. How do you think that went? What do you think you could do differently? And then once you've learned it, don't overdo it. Once it's become a habit, you don't need to think, keep thinking about it. You don't need to keep working at it. And if you do, you're going to get in the way. Just trust it. So when you go for a walk, you know how to walk. If you start interfering and paying too much attention to what your feet and ankles and knees and hips are doing, you're going to slow right down and you don't walk as well. You get in the way of yourself. Just trust it. You've learned how to walk. You know how to do it. Let it happen and think about something else. So feedback, we reduce the frequency, the more advanced you become. Uh, Self-reflection and biofeedback are very important. Biofeedback is the feedback from your own body. Uh, again, keeping positive and looking for what the singer does well and believe that your singers can change. Stay positive. Well, I've raced through that information um, because I had a lot I wanted to talk about. I'm now going to stop the share because we've got some questions coming up and then we may have more. Um, Bill says, do people who actually live in a rural environment have an above average sized hippocampus? Who knows? Um, they may do. Sorry, my viewer has just changed. That was me, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> You've done it to me. I'll go back to that one on oh, mine. There we go. I can see, I want to see everyone else's faces. I don't need to see mine. I know what I look like. Um, it's a relative thing. Uh, and we know the hippocampus will expand. For example, um, London taxi drivers have a much greater, uh, larger hippocampus because they've stored all that spatial awareness. And when they stop, when they retire, it goes down again. So you've got to keep stimulating it. Um, Dale says, are there ways to form myelin faster? I don't know. I don't know. Repetition certainly will form it and focused repetition so that you're not confusing your brain with other other messages. Um, the right kind of repetition with the, the brain in a, a happy place. Um, other than that, um, age helps, but we can't do much about that. Uh, Jay says, if you've had a mild TIA and lost the route to your nouns bank, how do you reconnect? You reconnect by thinking around it. So if somebody is confused about, you know, the thing, the thing, I remember my, um, my husband's grandmother used to phone up and say, the thing's broken. <laughs> you say, what thing? And you'd have to talk around and around and around to try and describe what the thing was. So what is it? Is it big or is it large? What room is it in? Where is it? What does it look like? You, you work around like that until the noun comes back or something similar. There's always generally more than one option anyway for the nouns. So you have to keep working at it and you have to find other routes around. But the brain is amazingly plastic and it will find other ways and you will learn other ways through. The inner game of tennis, absolutely. 
absolutely that was a seminal book back in the 70s wasn't it um which is all about the 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 conversations we have with ourselves and the way that and how we focus when we're learning and that has been adapted by this and in a game of music and all of those but the original one by timothy galway i think uh was a really really interesting book um regarding isolation before integration is it better to learn performance elements simultaneously or sequentially when starting with a new song do what is easy so don't bombard yourself with too much stuff that's tricky because it's just not going to help so start with the easy but also variety is going to help embed so toing and froing between the simultaneous you know everything in parallel and then things in sequence so the easiest way of course is to break it down to the smallest parts which are the easy ones to do and then we gradually increase yeah but then the challenge comes when you try everything all at once does that work does that help yes you can do it no you can't oh carla thank you for answering that that question it's an old book it was in the 70s it was published i think um but it's a it's a really interesting interesting idea um what are the benefits of back chaining uh it's to do with confidence if you've learned something from the end and you go back through so you learn the last bit first and then the last you know two bits and the last three bits you learn that so that when you then come to sing something through the further you go the, the longer you go through it the more familiar it becomes so we're all used to that the problem when you always start at the beginning and the beginning is very familiar and then when you by the time you get to the halfway or towards the end you're panicking and you're failing because you don't know it as well so you do the you, the opposite and you start with the end which means that as you progress through you become more and more confident because you know it better and better and better has anyone else got any questions would anyone like to unmute and ask a question we've got time would you like me to go back over anything and explain in more more detail any of the things that I talked about. Everyone's gone quiet. I think you've stunned everyone, Ginevra. <laughs> <laughs> the, brain, the brains are trying to absorb everything that you've. Uh... I know. So, having talked about learning and memory, I've actually managed to to not <laughs> help your learning or your memory. Um, I'm wondering if there would be anything useful to go back over. Um. Um, I would like to say that I found the whole thing really interesting and informative. And I, I really have enjoyed your chat. I think the main thing for me is to focus on the outcome and not to worry too much about the how you get there. Um, but of course, there's so much in it. I am hoping that we will be able to get all those notes online or something did you say that you're going to give us those notes there's if you've got um the chat box on your computer yeah um there's a pdf in there which has got all, oh, the, right. all the notes lovely so you can just just um drag that onto your desktop okay um, thank you very much Thank you, Noreen. That's very lovely to hear. The I think the focus on the outcome is a, a really important thing to remember because I mean I remember my early days of teaching. I was always as soon as I learned what the larynx was doing and what the vocal tract was doing, I was obsessed with teaching people to manipulate it. Um, and it actually doesn't help. Mm -hmm. It helps to know for me to know, 
and it can help for them to know as well but when they're actually singing it's not going to help so trying to maneuver what's going on internally here while you're actually singing is counterproductive you have to have got beyond that stage and the best way to get beyond it is to focus on in the emotional outcome and the intention and and the quality of the sound that you want ah can't see the notes again right i will just pop them into the chat again um there's my pdf oh hang on i could put it to everyone for some reason there that is going in again Uh, nearly there, it's downloading, there it is. The easy stuff first and then back chaining, yes. Okay, it's, um, start with the easy stuff and we're really, we don't. We always go and jump in and do the difficult bit and we work on the problem. But it's gonna, it's much, much easier for the brain to learn if you start with what you do well. Mm. Start with what is easy. We're just uh, we're just about um, coming to the end of the session now, folks. Lawrence, uh, um, who was hosting the session, his computer went down. Um, <laughs> so, oh no! Yeah. Um, so uh, I'd like to, if there's no other questions, if you have got any other questions, then please um, let let us know, and I'm sure I can pass them on uh, to, to Ginevra later. Um, but a, a huge thank you for your session today. It's been absolutely enlightening. Yes, some muted applause for you there thank you um i invited ginevra today because i've seen i've actually been to a couple of her classes in person and and, and know how um how knowledgeable she is on this subject so uh, I, i'm really pleased uh, that you've joined us today and that you've got the other session later on as well which yeah i'm coming back coming back in a couple of hours cool so once again thank you um thanks folks i hope you found it interesting and enjoyable and if you come into something else later on then We'll see you later.